Peter, hi. Hey, it's great to see you again, Peter. And you. So, as you know, I've been out to Lebanon recently, also Argentina, and traveled to a bunch of places. I've also been to Venezuela in the past. Uh, and I always think as a, as a Bitcoiner and somebody who makes content relating to money, you learn most by visiting the places with the, the most economic hardships. And, yep. um, you know, Argentina was challenging in certain ways, but Lebanon was particularly eye-opening. So I said to Danny, I was like, who do we talk to about this? <laughs> I need to talk to somebody about this. I need to, I need to tell them what I saw, and uh, and like get their feedback. Somebody who's, you know, uh, understands the need for smaller, maybe maybe no government. I don't actually know your hundred percent position, um, but somebody who will understand what I've been through. And and we both said yeah, actually, Peter, Peter Solange will be the guy to talk to. So I appreciate you coming on. Of course. Yeah, no, I, I really appreciate that endorsement. And yeah, absolutely. I've spent years in a lot of countries that, you know, have had various problems, uh, developing countries. And I think it's really interesting as a Bitcoiner because the value proposition of Bitcoin, like how it can change the world for Americans or British, uh, it's to a certain degree abstract, right? There's there's bank crashes, there's you know double digit inflation, but yeah, absolutely. When you actually spend time in these countries where currency collapse is a reality, it uh, it opens your eyes as a Bitcoiner. Well, I'll I'll talk you through Argentina f- first, and then Lebanon, and then I'll get to my questions. But but before that, just so I kind of truly understand you in your position. For you, what is the right size government? So philosophically, I believe in maximum freedom and I'm against any initiation of violence. So in a moral sense, I would advocate no government whatsoever that you know people can organize uh, if they like. So in theory, you could have a country that's the size of a household. You could have a essentially a sovereign landlord, which would look a lot like a monarch. Uh, There are, however, two very big practical uh, caveats on that. So number one, the state will attack competition first. So for example, they might defund the police and look the other way when looters are trashing grocery stores. But if a vigilante comes on the scene, they will pursue that with everything they have. And so in practice, there's this twilight zone where you've got anarchy, but you don't have the ability of the people to actually organize to counter that. And so I think that's why anarchy in general has a bad name, because that's that's generally the pattern. Uh, and then the second caveat is collective defense against other states. You know, so the metaphor I like is the lion. Okay, the male lion is completely useless. He does nothing. He doesn't hunt. He just sits around all day and sleeps. And the reason, uh, like the girl lions are okay with that because really the purpose of the male lion is to fight off other male lions because the other male lions will eat all of the babies to make their own, right? And so in a sense, the male lion is a complete parasite. He's useless, but in another sense, he's a, he is necessary because there are other male lions in the world. So in this context, if you actually had household-sized countries the other countries in the world would become interested in those. And before long, now you've essentially just handed you know everything away to some other government to abuse. Uh, it's, it's been a bit of a long journey for me on this with, uh, with Bitcoin because uh, I, when I discovered Bitcoin, I, I wasn't anyone who'd ever even heard of libertarianism. It wasn't a world I, I, would, I had been introduced to. You know, first, I discovered Bitcoin by pure chance. Uh, and then I started to study it and speak to people, and I heard about these libertarian ideas. And, and to begin with, I completely dismissed it. I was like, "You people are crazy! What, the, what are you on about?" But I've spoken to a lot of people, and I've had the ideas explained to me. And more often than not, I felt like I I agree with everything you're saying fundamentally as a principle. I've always felt like uh, the reality of of the ideas that libertarians have might not play out exactly as they as they hope. 
And so I often get called a status cuck because I defend democracy. And I say, well, dem- d- democracy is at least something we have in, you know, Western liberal democracies that, that gives us a little bit of a, a, a hope in, you know, choosing our own direction. And, you know, if we can have these separation of powers and hopefully we can hold these elite corrupt politicians to some account. Now, I, I think there's right. plenty of reasons to attack it. But but the other challenge I've really had is that I've I've kind of always felt that it doesn't really matter what I think because I kind of feel like perhaps the state is a natural monopoly in that if uh, – I, I read a long article where um, I think it was Scott Horton talked about the big red button to get rid of the state. But I always felt if you got rid of the state, you would reestablish a state or a state would reestablish. And the reason being is because uh, groups of people to organize or coordinate themselves would create rules and then, you know, who is the ruler who creates the rules? And then would you have a way of electing someone to create the rules? And would you eventually uh, merge with other towns for safety? Would you eventually recreate the same thing? And is there a risk in doing so that you actually create something worse than you have right now? But, you know, right. Perhaps not in China, perhaps not in Saudi, but maybe in the UK you would. So I've always felt like organ- we organize ourselves, we have structure, we have leaders, we have followers – and I always felt there's maybe a natural monopoly that you're fighting against. Does that make any sense? Uh, yeah, it absolutely does. And we are blessed to have a lot of natural experiments in the uh, British settlement of the Americas and also of Australia. And there, if you go through the history of how these different communities started, also New Zealand, you would have a bunch of people who would show up in some place and, uh, you know, they would sort of start out owning their own homestead and they wouldn't really have any kind of organization. But one of the first things they would do, and remember, these were remote. They were, you know, not really subject to the rule of London because they were just so far away. And one of the first things that they would do is elect some sort of local council. And it, it's it's just very natural. Uh, it is emergent. It, it doesn't necessarily require violence. Um, you know, people would get together. They would choose who they think is the most competent leader. Uh, a very logical way for humans to see that uh, as fair is to have an election fundamentally. So I do think that doc- that democracy is sort of a natural way to handle um, collective action organization. I think where it goes wrong is when the polity, when the political unit becomes too big. So if you're talking a very small community with like, you know, 50 families, then whoever they elect to be the leader is probably going to be a really good leader. They're not going to be corrupt. They're not going to do stupid things. They're not going to, you know, completely abuse members of the community because they all live together. (laughs) They have to spend time together. Uh, On the other hand, once you get to 320 million people, it, it, you know, then, I mean, it just turns into this rabid beast where you are attacking your enemies. Uh, you can invade foreign countries because somebody else is paying the bills. And so you could argue that rather than going to this extreme sort of, you know, Scott's uh, red button, uh, you could just break things down. So you move power to the local level uh, as much as possible. You get things to ideally either the town level or even the neighborhood level. Um, basically, if it can be handled at that lower level, so like streets, you know, streets should probably happen in a smaller unit than even a town. Um, I would like national defense to be at the town level, you know, so that like you would go to some, I don't know, you would go to Bedford and you would say, okay, here's the deal. You're going to pay a thousand dollars and then, you know, Slava Ukraine and boy, (laughs) people would not, (laughs) they would not do that. So Right. I think that small polity democracy gets you pretty darn close to the libertarian ideal. So let me talk about my two experiences. The Argentina, well, both both were not what I expected. When I was flying into Argentina, I, it was an 11-hour flight. So I downloaded a bunch of documentaries about what's been going on, news stories. And I realized the majority of them were actually either badly researched or propaganda mm-hmm. because they tended to show the same thing, like economic crisis and then people protesting. Um, the reality when you get there, there is, um, there's two sides to the super high inflation that people are experiencing. There is the, the poor side, it's the poor people, and, and they're essentially having to live on the peso. And the reason they have to live on the peso, there's certain restrictions. If they go to the dollar, they don't get their handouts. The government certainly needs 
a, a peso economy so they can print it so there's something they can print and use even though they're right. hyperinflating in a way and they're essentially a large voting block that rely on the handout of the government and therefore are manipulated into believing the government is the only people looking after them yep. um and some of these protests people are paid to actually go to so there's that side and i feel like they're the ones being conned the most mm -hmm. um, because they're being conned into voting for more pain then you have the middle and upper class uh, whereby they have access to the tools to mitigate inflation whereby they can you know get credit cards which are uh, dollar denominated or they can access uh, cryptocurrency networks, not just Bitcoin. It's actually primarily they want Tether uh, on Tron, surprisingly. But because I think people find the best, I think in an almost free market, people find the best tool for them. And the best tool for them is Tether because they want the stability of the dollar and Tron, which right. is the cheapest network. Let's We, we can all ignore the ideological arguments about it being a shitcoin. That's what they want. Um, but they have access to that. They have access to foreign uh, exchange markets. They have access to foreign uh, uh, equity markets. They have all these different tools where, best possible, they can mitigate the issues of inflation. They also trade ab abroad a bit more. Um, and generally speaking, they can't avoid all the effects of inflation, but they can avoid some of it. They can also benefit from it. Um, they can play right. the system. And so... They see the government for exactly what they are, ineffective, useless, and corrupt, um, and want for something else. So there's kind of two sides to Argentina. You can see the downward spiral, but the poorest people are essentially uh, still voting for similar type of parties, and then the uh, wealthier people want to vote for an alternative party, but both see the solution as immediately political, to their current needs. And then interestingly, you have this separate group, which is the youth, which see no future at all because they can't get jobs. If they can, they can't really save and they can't afford to buy a house. And so a lot of them are leaving, but those who are staying also see a political solution. But a lot of them see a little political solution in Malay, who is essentially a libertarian who is now leading the polls. So... That was my experience in Argentina, where everyone saw a political solution. Let's go to Lebanon. My experience was entirely different. They are further down the road of government corruption, of government collapse, of hyperinflation, to the point where there's effectively no government right now. They exist. They're corrupt. They're doing their corrupt things. They're printing money, but there's no effective government. Most you know, large parts of government have collapsed. So there is still kind of an army, but as I got there, they'd passed a new law that said people who work for the army can now have a second job because essentially they're being paid in the lira and yep. it's uh, been debased so much they need a second job to live. Uh, and there's still certain parts of, you can still get your passport sorted and there's still border control, but large other parts have collapsed. Sorry, there's a lot to explain here, so bear with me. Yeah, yeah. When I got there, I was aware that there was an energy crisis as well. They Essentially, the grid has not collapsed, but it's only providing energy for two hours a day. Wow. Um, and one of the things I hadn't realized, because when I got there, it was particularly dark. And I said, oh, yes, yeah, it's, it's really dark. Obviously, that's because of the energy uh, crisis. He, he said, yeah, there's pretty much no streetlights in Beirut. But what hadn't crossed my mind is when you lose streetlights, you also lose traffic lights. So you get to these junctions, there's no traffic lights, so people were figuring out how to get across. So the first 24 hours was 24 hours was a bit of a culture shock. I was a bit like, what is going on here? This is this is weird. Yet we still went out and the restaurants were full and the bars were full and life was going on. And so over the week, what I discovered, mainly in Beirut, is that without any effective government, they essentially had anarchy. And it was kind of working in that what I discovered was when I went around to people's houses, they showed me these little local mini grids they'd built in their buildings, were, which covered the energy for the building, whereby there was a generator, there would be solar power, 
there would be batteries and there would be an inverter. So people need power for air conditioning, also to work, to power their laptops, their phones, and their lights. So they built a solution without any regulation or asking any permission, and they were everywhere because they needed power. There was a group called Rebirth Beirut, which is essentially going through the pro. It's an NGO, but it's going. Th- it doesn't. It's no government affiliation, and it's going through the process of relighting the streets. The economy is essentially uh, dollarized, but into a cash dollar economy because there's no trust in the banks. I didn't see any police anywhere, and I, mm-hmm. I got what I kind of realized. I was like, "You kind of have anarchy here because you've you're rebuilding the con- the economy with your own." currency, your own dollar currency. You're not paying tax because there's no one to tax you. You're not you've rebuilt your energy network. You've basically you they're, they're rebuilding Beirut outside of government. Right. And so I was like struck with you know, people are people are hardworking, people are resilient, people um understand their needs without any interference of government. They're actually quite effective. Mm-hmm. And because they're not paying any tax, they're able to reinvest and rebuild Beirut. But what was also interesting when you started talking to people, you said, well, you know, I would say to them, like, like, this is working, this is great. They'll say, yes, but we're missing a few things. If I buy a car, there is nowhere to register it because we've lost that. And so if someone steals my car, I can't prove it's mine. Similar with land registry, we have issues with land registry. So if I buy land, how do I prove it's my land? And that was a real issue for them. So certain things about that, that tend to be centralized with regards to, uh, you would probably say this is just basically uh, the enforcement of property rights. That was the bit that was missing. And to get certain things done, you were still, you could get certain things done, but you'd have to bribe people. And so I, would, I kind of came to this conclusion. I was like, okay. Anarchy can kind of work as long as you've got an enforcement of property rights uh, and a rule of law. That's where I came to this conclusion. Yeah. So that's my experience. (laughs) Yeah, and I think you're absolutely right. So you're describing Lebanon in that earlier twilight zone where some government functions are still working, others are not. Um, In many ways, they're in the happy zone where government is so poor at this point that it can barely pay the Praetorian Guard. Uh, So, (laughs) you know, a lot of those mini electric grids are probably illegal, strictly speaking. Uh, But the government, you know, that's not a priority to clamp down on that. And that can be quite good. And as you described, the one missing piece there, the one thing that, you know, keeps that from being a utopia is exactly that the courts are still government run. You know, you do have in a lot of places in the world, um, for example, slums in Lagos tend to have, they essentially have, um, you know, like elders. And those elders have a lot of uh, social capital. And if a thief is caught, they don't bother bringing the police into it because that's just gonna be a bribe and then the guy's gonna be marching around town next week. So instead, they take them to the village elder. The elder puts them out on a boat. Well, first, the elder decides if uh, he thinks the people committed the crime. So you have like a real simple, real informal, you know, the one side says what they saw. You have witnesses. Uh, You know, you don't have to hire a lawyer and all that. So this is something that poor people can access. They just come in and tell the elder, this is what I saw. The other guy tells his side of the story. If the elder decides that he was a criminal, then they put him on a boat. They take him around town. They announce that he's a criminal, and at that point, he's exiled. Now, if you're exiled, then if you're in Nigeria, where are you going to go? So you're going to go to some other slum. And as soon as you get to that other slum, people are going to say, where are you from? Okay? So at that point, realistically, you're living under a bridge now. Okay? That <laughs> you're, you're living with people who you don't want to live with, <laughs> like real bad people. So there's this really, really elegant system, but the key there is that the Nigerian government has so little money that it's not interfering in that sort of bottom-up, anarchic legal system. Now, I suspect in other places, they actually impose death sentences. I know in Papua New Guinea, there was a show a couple of years ago, Living with the Mech, where two British anthropologists went and lived with um, people in rural New Guinea. And 
there were apparently death sentences passed uh, at that level for there was one person who murdered somebody else. And, you know, the state was so remote that that entire legal system was local. And first of all, you had zero crime. Um, I was living in, in uh, Jakarta, Indonesia a couple of years ago. I remember picking up the newspaper. Somebody had stolen silverware. Okay, they'd reached in through the, you know, the bars on the kitchen window and they stole some silverware. So the woman in the house raised the alarm. People grabbed this guy. They beat him to death. But there were Pretty no witnesses. Nice. Yeah. And it, it's sort of eye-opening, you know, in this day and age when, you know, we're sort of obsessed with, you know, being fair to criminals in this. In the natural order, crime is not tolerated. And, you know, I think that's sort of what you get to. In many ways, it's a more just society. Just, just don't screw around. Don't steal things. Don't uh, attack people. And if you do, then it's, it's curtains for you. That almost, that sounds like almost like decentralized rule of law. Right. What you said, you may even lead to less crime more justice in some ways. It's going to be a hard sell for some people. Oh, for sure. Because <laughs> we're so conditioned to the world we live in whereby the first step is usually to call the police. Right. The second step is an investigation. Third step is perhaps a trial and conviction. Um, and so you could probably look at something like rape cases that have a very low uh, reporting rate because of the low conviction rate. Um, you could see a world of uh, emotion coming into decisions like this and seeing more mob, mob justice. I right. don't really have a point or a question. I think more that it's just a very different world. And, and, and you're right that there's a scaling problem. So that kind of a system yeah. works if you've got a small enough community that everybody knows everybody's background. You know, so... Um, you know, if there's a rape suspicion, then people are going to know the reputations of both parties involved, and those are in practice going to figure into it. On the other hand, uh, you know, I think the slums of Lagos, even though they're large, I think that there's a lot of social density and people really know each other. Uh, on the other hand, you know, if you're looking at like central London, where <laughs> most people don't don't know their neighbor and don't really want to. Uh, that's going to be really hard. Um, it's going to be hard to decide cases. You're going to have the possibility of um, bias. Uh, it, it, it's You sort of lose that social connection that I think fuels that kind of bottom-up justice. Yeah, and I think that is... So when I, I hear examples, you know, I've spoken to people similar to you, often the examples tend to be the slum in Nigeria, this example here, these like niche right. use cases. And this is where I come back to my challenges. I'm like, but how do you do this with London? Even Bedford right. is a you know decent sized town. How do you scale this to cities? Because, you know, I, d I don't want to be considered somebody who is a uh, status cuck, somebody who is anti-freedom. But part of me thinks is... We're born, you know, hopefully, we'd like to think we're born free, but essentially we're born into a structure. But I think these structures have been established because we fought for freedom. I feel like freedom is, whilst it's something we feel like we, we deserve as a birthright, because of the way humans are, I feel like it's something we've actually had to fight for. Right. So, so how, how do these scale? That, that's my biggest challenge. Yeah, and there are always trade-offs. Um, you know, we can go back through history to eras where there has been a lot less crime, even with a formal state. Um, let's just take Britain uh, in the 19th century during the Victorian era. Uh, there was much less murder. There was much less overall crime. Uh, it was not a significantly different, you know, sort of core structure. You know, you still had tax-funded magistrates and tax-funded police and investigators. Uh, you did have, I think, a larger component of private investigation. So uh, the, the police were more or less watchmen. And if you actually wanted uh, to pursue a serious crime, then you would often hire a private detective. So there were some mm -hmm. elements, elements of it that were a lot more private, which have now been taken over by the state. And the state generally does everything badly. Um, so, you know, I think a sort of a starting point is to kind of minimize it and say, OK, hold on. What are the points of this that are most liable to, say, bribery? Right, we could imagine a private investigator if they're the only source of information on this, 
you're paying them, right? One side is paying them, the other side is not. So you can imagine a problem there. So in other words, you 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 kind of boil it down to, you know, what are the parts here where um, there's the highest risk in providing it uh, privately? And then in, so you sort of take those, boil down to the absolute skeleton of where the state might be able to do it. And at that point, you have to watch it like a hawk. Watching it like a hawk, for one thing, the smaller communities helps. People care more about whether they have dirty police in their community if you only have three cops in your town. Um, and just if the government is doing a lot less, then there's less to watch. You know, if you look at the British or American government today, it is it is impossible to keep an eye on them. They're, it's like they they overwhelm us. You know, the the industry I'm in, in theory, is a watchdog to the government. There's like 20 of us, and there's 17 million of them. Uh, it is impossible. So, you know, I think the goal is to keep in mind what the perfect is. Uh, and then try and get there through successive approximations. So you sort of iterate step by step. You look at this function, you say, oh, the government doesn't really need to do that. They're not particularly good at it. So let's let's put that back in the private sector. And you start to get to this point where the people who actually are in government, the people who are managing those really, really important rails, things like courts, those are people who, you know, they are the best, they're the brightest, and there's few enough that voters can actually see what they're doing. Uh, and then, you know, through their votes, they can then express some oversight over them. Whereas today, you know, the degree to which the average British voter feels like they have control over the things the government does, I think, I think it's almost zero. And so in that kind of a world, if your vote doesn't really matter in practical terms, like your vote's not actually going to change anything, then you may as well vote on you know, uh, sort of abstract, you know, I like being nice to people. And so, you know, I'm going to vote for this side or something like that. I think that uh, voter apathy is certainly something that exists. I, I have it. I know friends have it. Um, I, I think we have a very ineffective government right now and we have done for a long time. Um, but I, I think you make an interesting point is that these binary arguments of government, no government are, are actually ineffective. I think what's more important is the trajectory. Right. Are we heading towards bigger government or are we heading to more smaller government? Are we heading to more centralized government powers or are we decentralizing power? I was actually listening to a podcast on the way down with um, Rory Stewart and Alistair Campbell where they were talking to two mayors uh, and they were saying that actually the UK uh, has the most centralized power structures of some group in Asia. I can't remember if they were talking about the G8 or the you know, OECD, whatever it is. But um, they were talking about we had the most and, and what they've been pushing for is more uh, decentralized power down to the city level and then from the city level to the town level. Yes. The biggest challenge with this is how many people actually think like this. That, you, know, you do to, to probably the most important degree, the, the smallest possible groups. Um, I think there's a there's a certain group of people in the UK who maybe think to the city level and the, right. perhaps some to the town level, but there's no weight, there's no effective push towards this. Uh, and that or, that's the, the thing that I find really challenging. It's like, how do you change this? It's almost like, I, I, I feel like even though having a political party is kind of antithetical to being a libertarian, I kind of think it would be good if there was more libertarian political parties whose sole mandate was to reduce the size of government. Yeah, and I think that you can exploit certain sort of gifts of nature. So, for example, uh, whether you're talking to left or right, the proposition that decisions should be made by the local community, everybody loves that, right? People yeah. don't see that as a political question. And I mean, it's not, that's neither left nor right, right? You know, the, the um, Seattle had this communist enclave last year or whatever, two years ago for a minute. Um, and, you know, pe people on the left didn't look at that and say, this is horrific. It's just local. Um, you know, people love local. Uh, of course, who does not love local and, you know, why I think it's not politically salient, sort of devolving powers down. Uh, the people who don't like local are the power brokers. 
the professionals who deal in power because mm. there's an enormous economy of scale to power, right? If you've got influence at, in London, you do not want to devolve things to these losers in you know ten thousand towns across the country, uh, because that's that's your game. You know you've got a big hunk of it for yourself, and so it's like many issues today. I think you've got this really bipartisan coalition where the people of all stripes, of all ideologies, uh, have one point of view, and then the people who are sort of professional power break brokers have another. Uh, one way to get past that is the frog in the boiling pot. So the power brokers screw up so badly that you get kind of a Thatcher or Reagan moment where you know voters just kind of wake up one morning and say, what we're doing is not working. I want to try something else. Um, uh, they maybe don't even particularly care what the something else is. They just say this isn't working. Uh, ideally, Rather than the frog actually, you know, boiling before they jump, ideally you explain that the boiling is coming and then you encourage the frog to do something about it before it gets too hot. Well, I think we are, we are kind of seeing a small amount of that in the UK at the moment. We're seeing a reversal of a number of policies by Rishi Sunak's government because we have an election looming and conservatives <laughs> are losing power. And I think they've, I think they realize they've uh, sway, uh, strayed a long way from traditional conservative values there's a lot of quite quite hard 180 turns on some policies which i which i think i think is kind of interesting um but do you do you get a sense that there is this kind of swing now cuz I, I do you know and, yeah. you know we we had a, a a devolution of power from europe with our brexit um we had donald trump whatever you think of him kind of he was kind of pushing towards a devolution away from trust in centralized powers. So, right. yeah, under a kind of populist re rhetoric. Um, but I do feel like this swing is start starting to happen. Just It's just not a big swing. Yeah, I think it is, um, it's definitely a huge trend. If you look at social trust in elite institutions, it is evaporating everywhere. Even if they tell the truth, nobody believes them at this point, which yeah. warms my heart. <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, yeah. what, what is it? Uh, verify, don't trust. Um, but yeah, people are not believing the elite. They are turning on them. The elite is screwing up by numbers, so this is not surprising. I think the elite's actually been screwing up for a long time, but they had the lapdog media and to you know media explain everything, and you didn't really have a way to get around it. Murray Rothbard, the libertarian economist, he talked about the 1970s. You could get the entire global libertarian movement in a living room. And the way that they spread the gospel was that they would put little advertisements in the bottom of random magazines, like, you know, financial or like time, like lifestyle magazines. And it would say, you know, to learn more about libertarianism, send $20 uh, in an envelope and then, you know, we'll send you our newsletter. I mean, that... That was like the state of alternative media, at least on the right. On the left, there were anarchist bookstores and things like that. Um, but even there, I mean, it was relatively difficult to get the message out. You really had to do it hand to hand, person by person. Now, of course, whether it's right or left, whether it's you know Bernie Sanders or, or uh, Donald Trump or Vivek, I mean, you can reach just millions upon millions of people at once. And so that was always going to challenge uh, the elite who has gotten away with this monopoly over uh, the facts for so long. So it would be shocking if people weren't questioning them. Uh, they're no dummies, so they identified the problem. You know, once you had Trump and Brexit happening at the same time, I think they categorized those as sort of a mental uprising by the people. Uh, the sheep were not buying it anymore. I think previous to that, they saw the history as they were destined to win. They were going from strength to strength. They were capturing increasing parts of society, really in every respect, the economy, the schooling. Uh, they were really replacing religion with this sort of state ideology. So I think they were very, very optimistic. And then when 2016 happened, that combination of events freaked them out. They started thinking, maybe we're losing because people are seeing through this. And so they did what you would expect them to do, which is that they focused all their energies on censorship. The thing is, that 
I think it backfires fundamentally. Um, I think part of the reason why the content that you and I put out um, ha has become so popular so quickly is because there are so few voices talking on our side. As you constrict those, you know, you'll see somebody in China who put out like a Winnie the Pooh meme, which is making fun of President Xi, and it'll get like 500 million shares. Okay. I love Winnie the Pooh, but he's not that good, right? What's happening there is that <laughs> as you squeeze the speech, whatever speech is left is just outrageously popular because people are hungering for it. So I am very, um, I'm optimistic that people are seeing through it. Uh, they're absolutely going to fight it with everything they have. I think there'll be a lot of people put in prison for free speech. Um, and, you know, if we sort of look for a historical moment that's similar to it, it's probably the Reformation in Europe, where you had the printing press. The printing press means that you could print cheap Bibles, right? And at that point, you had this political movement that said, you don't need the church. You don't need this corrupt elite telling you how to live. You can access the source code directly, and, you know, you can decide for yourself. And that moment was very, very similar to today. You could print up pamphlets after Gutenberg and you could organize like, uh, <laughs> I don't want to use kinetic words because <laughs> we live in a censorship age. You could organize protests, vigorous protests against your government. And, you know, the, in the French Revolution, in Britain, there were many vigorous protests uh, that mm -hmm. occurred in London and the elite eventually had to cede power. They could not hold on. However, there was a lot of violence. So I hope that we're not going to get there. Uh, but I think if we look back through history, the closest moment is really, I guess it's the 1400s in the decades following Gutenberg. So do you look at uh, any political leaders uh, right now as a kind of reaction to this? Do you, do you look at Bukele in El Salvador? And I know there are questions around him, but really he's gone up against the global world elite uh, uh uh, organizations and in some ways is still is winning. Millet is, I find Millet in Argentina super interesting just because yep. he's uh, he's very radical and uh, everything they've tried for the last three decades in Argentina has failed. Uh, what they haven't tried is, you know, somebody who's first, well, one of his first policies is to get rid of the central bank, which I obviously understand you would uh, totally yep. support. Do you, and, I, I sometimes feel like maybe it's in these nations, these smaller nations, where they have kind of, it's almost like you have to fully break to be able to do something a bit more radical. In the UK, right. we, we're not broken enough. Yes. You know, we, we can, you know, we, we're slowly getting poorer. You know, right. our money's slowly buying less. We're slowly getting more squeezed. You know, we've got a little bit less money each month. Everything's getting a bit more expensive, but... Yeah, we, we're the boiling frog. Bingo, um, right. But whereas in like Argentina, they've boiled so hard, people are jumping, they're jumping out. Exactly. And so do, do you, uh, do, can you give any um, uh, kind of credit to the idea that someone like a Millet actually, whilst working with the, in the apparatus of the state, can be a force for good? I think absolutely. Um, I think the boiling frog metaphor exactly describes it. And what's interesting is that when the water gets hot in one country and the people do jump, that then becomes a model for all these other places. So, you know, I imagine that a lot of Malay um, supporters also look to Bukele and, you know, what he accomplished there. And I understand the criticisms of Bukele but, you know, I would ask for regular Salvadorians, not the middle class, not the 20 families that have controlled the country for 100 years, for regular people, for little abuelitas, you know, trying to go out and play with the kids in the park in the evening time and not have to worry. Okay, for those people, he has been an enormous source for good. Uh, <laughs> you know, the best they've had, I guess, in a century. Uh, and so that becomes a model you know, when we kicked off, you were talking about how a lot of regular people or maybe people with lower education, they are sort of the uh, cannon fodder who are used to push these socialist movements. And of course, the tragedy is that they then become the victims of it. And I think that somebody like Bukele 
you know, the idea of cleaning up the streets, right, of locking up tens of thousands of hardened, hardened gangsters that is so appealing to those regular people, you know, this is not some abstract, you know, tax reform, some Thatcherites, you know, the homes with the vouchers and no, no, no. This is very, very easy for regular people to understand and to get behind. Now, in theory, the elite should be able to see that. Um, they bribe all the professors and all the you know, high IQ people. So uh, they should, <laughs> in theory, be able to bring them in and, and uh, actually mimic them. Uh, I guess some of them will. Uh, but you know, broadly speaking, I think, in especially in a lot of rich countries, the state has become so captured by activists. Um, you know, for example, if we see the US right now where the border is wide open, that does not happen anywhere. Mexico does not have an open border. Okay, if if Guatemalans sneak across the Mexican border and Mexico thinks that they're planning on staying, right? Not just waving them through, but they're actually going to stick around. Mexico puts them in camps with barbed wire. Okay, they are not <laughs> an open border country. Uh, so that's so unnatural. Um, it's obviously unpopular with the people who have to pay for all this, uh, the voters. So you might ask, why are they doing it? Uh, you know, it's such an own goal. And I think the reason is because at this point, the activists, first they captured, or first they got the influence so that they could uh, sort of control government. But now I think they've actually been so good at building that up that, I mean, literally they are like immune to public opinion. They can make the government do the most insane things, whether it's gender or whether it's complete open borders. I mean, things that you have to go back through history to find anything remotely just that insane. If I were rooting for the for for like Joe Biden, I'd be like, stop that! You're gonna, <laughs> you know, you're gonna you're gonna make all of our guys lose our jobs. It's just completely insane. But I think that that's where we are. Is that the sort of activists have captured it? The and it's not really right or left per se, because um, you know a lot of the traditional power brokers on the right have sort of allied with these activists. Um, I guess they figure. Uh, <laughs> do bad things to me last. Um, but at any rate, that sort of elite, I think at this point, has just gone off the crazy end. They're almost incapable of turning back because the activists would have them for lunch. So that means that I think the boiling water, there's normally, they sort of pull it back a little bit and they say, no, 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 we've gone too far. And then you have somebody like a Bill Clinton who ran on uh, a secure border, uh, you know, you have these these sort of centrists who come back in to kind of calm everybody down and let it go on a simmer. They don't actually go backwards, but they delay it long enough that the frog uh, relaxes again. And I wonder at this point if they can even do that. So I can give you a couple of uh, anecdotal stories from El Salvador because I've been there a couple of times. Uh, firstly, just the idea of how much control and how scary the gangs were. Um, yeah. I visited an NGO in San Salvador. And I was asking about, you know, explain to me the gangs. And they were explaining to me these red zones you can't go into. But they also said, um, yeah, if you're the leader of a gang and you spot some young girl, she might be 12 or 13, you would go to the, their family and say, I'm taking her. And, wow. if, uh, and if you fought that, they would kill your whole family. And that, yep. that was a very real situation, a very real threat. And something as a parent, you're like, what? And they said, yeah, what would happen? Sometimes people would try and escape and they would try and leave the country because their choice was choices were leave, stay and have your daughter taken and part of the wow. gang, or yeah. you all be murdered. The, 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 the crime rates were so high. But the even more interesting anecdotal story is I wanted to get a tattoo when I was there. So we went down to one of these zones. I had some, some armed security with us, but I ended up speaking to somebody down there and they said, actually, do you know what? Under Bikeli, it's very different now. And this was pre-locking everyone up. This is when he just first started to almost broker the arrangements with the gangs. Um, he said, prior to Bukele, you couldn't use your phone on the street. If you used your phone on the street, it would be snatched yep. or you'd be killed for it. He said, I can walk down the street now and use my phone. You know, with security and safety comes prosperity. Yes. And, you know, I understand the arguments, particularly the human rights groups are making with regards to this you know, locking everybody up because you're going to be capturing innocent people in this process and they're going into jail. And and, it, and I do struggle with that, but I also know there's a there's a net equation to be done with the innocent people caught up in, in the crime. Right. But I think it's undoubtable that he has changed the trajectory of that country and one that has historically lived under uh, multiple corrupt mm -hmm. administrations. 
And so for me, I, I've kind of seen now, I was like, ah, oh, so, I mean, he kind of is a dictator, but he's a benevolent <laughs> dictator. So, so how does this work out? That, does he do one more election? Does he do two more? Does he, I, I don't know the future trajectory. I, I, my hope is that it's nothing but good, but you never know. You know, you, you don't know who he, he, who was succeeding, what they will do. But I certainly think right now the trajectory for El Salvador has forked into a more positive direction. Yeah, I think without a doubt. Um, and, you know, we don't know uh, what's going to happen in the future, but I do think that sort of in modern days we're conditioned uh, to just sort of take democracy as this automatic angel. Like you can take any policy whatsoever and once you run it through democracy, now it's good. Uh, and, you know, of course, there was a famous election in the 1930s in Germany uh, where the bad guy won uh, a democracy and a lot of terrible things happened. Democracy can do really, really awful things. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, dictators, you know, this is the Hans Hermann Hoppe thing, and there, there's a massive community uh, who supports him. He wrote a book called Democracy, the God That Failed. Yeah. Uh, and he's comparing the Austro-Hungarian Empire specifically, but, you know, sort of more generalizable. Uh, his model is that a monarch treats the country like it's the family business. And the way that you maximize the value of the family business is that you want it to be prosperous and you want it to be a pleasant place to live so that other high value people move into your, um, you know, private domain uh, and make it rich. So I, I guess like a sovereign Disney would be the model <laughs> if like Disney could take a cut of everybody's income uh, who moved in there. Uh, so, I mean, it's certainly possible uh, to do it either way, you know, so autocracy or monarchy are not automatically evil. Democracy is not automatically good. Uh, it's, I mean, it's been a thousands year projects to try to figure out exactly how you uh, condition people, how do you create a political culture. Um, if we go back to Britain, I think that there were times in the 19th century when you didn't need a very strong constitution. It was kind of an understood, uh, well, let me put that differently. There was a very strong constitution in Britain, but it wasn't written down. It was understood, right? There was a very tight community. Um, it was not perfect. There was certainly corruption, but you know, compared to a lot of other models, um, if you have that kind of a culture, then I think you can sustain a lot of different models. The model is almost secondary to that kind of political culture. And so what does that, as a libertarian, I think that sort of the key ingredient of that is property rights. If you respect property rights, everything else automatically comes from that. Uh, you engender small business, the sort of bourgeois mentality. The bourgeois mentality is to be extremely tolerant. You want to do business with everybody. You want to make money from them. <laughs> you want them to buy your product. You want them to partner, you know, to partner with you. Um, it's a very, very positive culture. Um, we can see that, you know, if we compare country pairs, like if you go to North Korea versus South Korea, people are much happier and trusting and open to strangers in South Korea. Uh, I spent about five years in Taiwan. You can see it there. The Taiwanese yeah. culture is sort of um, like if you run, ran a natural experiment, you took Chinese culture without the communism. Okay. And they're, they're very friendly, open, you know, tolerant. You walk into cafes, they're like, hello. I mean, yeah. it's, it's just, it's amazing how the culture softens people. The tricky part is how do you adjust the culture without abusing people, right? How do you do it? without doing it by force, because any time the government gets involved in doing it, uh, it generally backfires. It, it ends up serving whatever interests the, the government has, but of course the government interests are gonna come from lobbyists and activists and so on. So it's a tricky question, but I do think that it really comes down to political culture and how you foster that. Right, the, the final thing I wanted to talk to you about, again, I wanna go back to Lebanon, and I think you'll like this because it comes down to money. But essentially, with the collapse of government, they now have a free market for money. Um, and I know I could, in a similar way in the UK, argue that I do. I mean, I can use Bitcoin with trade, but not many people are. Um, I, I, you know, in Lebanon, there's a free market for money by necessity. The lira is performing so poorly that people want dollars. There are people using Bitcoin. There are people using Tether. But it's kind of this free market where people are figuring it out. So what's tending to happen is 
you can't get away from using the lira because it exists. Mm -hmm. And you, you go into shops and small change tends to come in lira because you know, the shops have got it. They want to get rid of it. And when <laughs> right. you've got it and you go to a shop, you want to get rid of your lira first and you want to have the dollars. It means you're fully seeing Gresham's law play out in real time. Right. And then those who understand uh, uh, Bitcoin are also choosing to hold on to that. So like fully in Gresham's law, the, 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 the pyramid is they'll get rid of their, their lira first, then their dollars, and they'll hold on to their Bitcoin. That's the last thing they'll get rid of. But this currency competition is happening. And what it is proving is that, again, in Gresham's law, that the hardest money is the one being retained. Right. <laughs> you know, and it's fascinating to see it in real time. It's fascinating to go to shops and see the options you have and see how people are, are using it. And so uh, even uh, even though I know under the dollar they they are kind of subservient to the US, uh, to the Fed and the central bank there, but that idea of monetary competition is, is fascinating to me and it kind of makes me look at, okay, well, Millet wants to get rid of the central bank in Argentina, great, but still subservient to the Fed. Mm -hmm. Perhaps, perhaps every country should be considering getting rid of their central banks and having currency competition, which, which you would have under a situation where there's minimal to no government anyway. But right. to see it in real time, you're seeing the proof that currency competition is super important. Yeah, without a doubt. It's you know massive to a country. Uh, the money fundamentally, if the money doesn't work, then that undermines all property rights in the entirety of society. What it also does is chases out capital, right? So not only you know you have a Gresham's law with the currency, you also have a Gresham's law with the capital when you have weak property rights. Uh, even China, which you know they make an attempt um, because they know that voters judge them on on the prosperity. Uh, but even then, you know you've got trillions of dollars that have just flooded out of these countries that have weak property rights. So um, yeah, I mean countries countries with really bad central banks. I can understand the idea of going to dollarization. That's a lot more reassuring to businesses in the country. Uh, you know, if you announce that you're going to go directly to Bitcoin and only Bitcoin, then that's going to have a lot of disruptions. There's a lot of organizations mm -hmm. that, rightly or wrongly, are afraid of that. Um, and you know, the problem there is that if you then get an economic crash because these organizations are fleeing. Uh, then the people are going to turn on it. They're going to say, no, 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 that was a horrible idea. Um, so, you know, I'm sympathetic to these half measures. And so when Malay talks about dollarizing, you know, the Fed is not that bad. I mean, <laughs> don't, oh, well, no, don't, don't quote me. Okay, it's You it's quoted yourself. <laughs> when we, when <laughs> we release the show, we're going to have a big <laughs> photo of you with a speech bubble. The Fed is not that bad. The Peter Fed Sinange. is not that bad. <laughs> I think you so, mean right. relative to the Argentine Central Bank or the thank, Lebanese th Central Bank. Thank you for covering me, Peter. That's right, right. So, you know, compared to the peso, the lira, compared to a lot of currencies in the world, the Fed is not that bad for a lot of people. And if you sort of lay out the amount of economic devastation that's coming from their current central bank, then they can get about 80% of the juice, it's a non-scientific number, from going to, um, to the U.S. dollar. So I can understand why they're doing that. And of course, the U.S. dollar has low transaction costs. It's actually more reassuring for foreign investors to the degree that matters. Um, and it, it, But right, in the long run, I think that you want to go to something that actually has more basis. Uh, gold is more familiar to people. Um, you know, even just in living memory, we had a financial system that was completely based on gold. Uh, so a lot of people can get their heads around it, especially older people. And then, of course, I think uh, we might have talked about this last time, but you know, mm. depending when the theoretical uh, collapse is happening, uh, if enough people know and understand Bitcoin, then you know, of course, I think Bitcoin avoids uh, one of the biggest vulnerabilities of gold, which is that it has to be centralized somewhere. You have to put it in a vault with sharks with lasers, and then the men from government will come and visit that vault, and they will tell you uh, what you're going to do with your gold. But yes, I am. I am. Perfectly happy with a Malay style uh, dollarization as a first step, uh, which alleviates some of the pain for the long suffering uh, Argentinian people. And it also gets people used to the idea that, you know, a currency is not built in. Um, it gets them away from sort of currency nationalism, which I think gets in the way. 
Uh, a lot of Americans, for example, feel very proud of the dollar. I'm sure a lot of British feel, or at least used to feel proud of the pound. Well, we uh, were when we rejected the euro, when we had our referendum on the euro, we were like, there you no, go. We're, we're staying with the pound. We're very proud of it. And so, you know, it's sort of good to, I mean, if those currencies, you know, were, were backed by something hard, then go for it, guys, you know, by all means. But in the sort of current environment where, uh, the central banks are just in-house money printers for legislators. That that seems unhealthy to have that kind of national obsession with the currency. Well, so again, interesting about the Lebanon. I mean, it was just such a profound experience to to see so many things playing it out. So you you hear the theories. You know, Bitcoin fixes this and get blah blah blah. And people have all their different theories. But when you go and travel somewhere and see it, you you have the real evidence of what people do because people will ultimately usually be fairly selfish in making the best decisions for them. Right. Um, but the dollarized economy is a cash economy. So people have safes in their house where they keep the money. Uh, and so they have issues with large amounts of cash. Right. Um, what a couple of pe- business owners I spoke to, they said, our biggest challenge at the moment of inward investment is there are no banks here that anyone can trust. Yeah. That is our biggest problem. We need banks here that people can trust where there can be inward investment. I don't know the answer for that for the people of Lebanon because the the banks essentially closed all their accounts one day and, and allowed the government to steal all their money. So there there is a low trust at the moment, but you know, that's one of the things that people said that that is required now because they can't they can't rebuild uh, the whole of Lebanon as a cash economy. Right. Yeah, and that is tricky. Um tether things like tether can serve the purpose for the depositor uh, but then you've got the problem of the lender, right? So kind of the ideal of a banking system, even a fair one, uh, is that depositors pull their capital and then the bank lends that and then you can build bridges or business or thing, things like that. And that's really the part that uh, that is missing there. And, you know, we've got a lot of creative solutions that have to do with blockchains, but uh, there's a number of issues with them where, you know, I don't think they're ready for prime time and probably won't be, um, for a long time. And even in Bitcoin, I don't think we have really well-developed um, sort of tools for deploying um, savings. Uh, that's partly just because of the legal gray area that, you know, governments, um, with the exception of Bukele, they've been pretty hostile to Bitcoin. Maybe that'll change over time. Uh, it, you know, it's a separate question now that banks are getting into ETFs and, you know, sort of, you um, plunging into Bitcoin with both feet. Maybe they start deploying their lobbyists. Maybe that is good in some ways, bad in many ways. Uh, So I think that there's going to be a lot of activity uh, happening in really the credit space. Uh, Also, hopefully the transaction costs, um, you know, you mentioned earlier, uh, that's probably the reason why Lebanese are getting into Tether. It's not that they necessarily like Tether per se, it's just that the transaction costs are cheap. Uh, So in those two areas, I'm I guess the optimistic way to put it would be I'm I'm looking forward to new innovation coming into the Bitcoin yeah. space. But of course, <laughs> you know, the implicit comment is that we're not there yet, guys. Like <laughs> we got a lot more work to do. A bit of patience, a bit of patience. Well, look, Peter, yeah. I, it was really good to get you. I, I I had to kind of try and explain my experience, but to somebody who's a you know, a, a, a well read libertarian to just kind of Kind of just express my experience and talk about my experience to just understand the context of that and what that means. I feel myself like every now and again, I, I get dragged in to being a libertarian, then I pull back. And like every, it's like I take two steps forward and then one back, two steps forward and then one back. But it was a, a profound experience going to Lebanon and just seeing what we're capable of or what humans are capable of when the it government stays out of our fucking yeah. business. And yeah. it, it kind of works. There were some bits missing. Some bits to be solved, but it kind of works. I, I'm still struggling on the scaling thing. Maybe, um, maybe you'll have some good book recommendations for me that I can go and read. But, um, but I, I'm certainly, it was certainly a profound experience. Yeah, yeah, it is astounding. And I mean, this is really what brings me to libertarianism in the first place. It's just the absolute beauty of what people do when they're free. It. I mean, literally, like it makes me cry when I see it. When I see like a street with like a whole bunch of pop-up restaurants and farmers selling produce, like this, like literally I get emotional. I'm like the guy with the double rainbow. 
Um, but yeah, it really is gorgeous. And you know, that that's part of the attraction of going to countries like that, where the state is, thank God, small enough where people uh, can actually build things uh, for themselves. Well, I would recommend anyone listening to go to Lebanon. It, you, you, you th- it's not what you think. I mean, I, I, most people said, was it safe? Were you safe? I was like, yeah, I was very safe. And they're like, well, what did you do? I was like, well, I went to restaurants and bars and chilled by the beach, what you do in most other countries. Like, yeah, exactly. Really? Was it, but really, was it safe? And I was like, you yeah, know, it, it was really safe. It was, it was fine. Look, Beirut is a city. It is the first to rebuild itself out, outside of you know being a capital city. That's where the the first money inflows, and that's where the you know, people historically have got money been safer have been. Mm-hmm. And as you get out into the more rural communities, it is a bit more desperate. Of course, it, you know, it's massively desperate. But you, there are like these strands of hope where you're like, okay, I can see what people can do when the government leaves them alone and doesn't fuck with the money. That's what I can yeah. see, and I, it was, it was, it was profound. And I, like I said, I recommend people go out there and check it out. And uh, yeah, it was short notice asking you this. I was, <laughs> I had to. I, I was like, all this energy inside of me like when I came back from Lebanon. I was like, right, I, I've got to talk to somebody about this because this is. Such a, a weird experience. So appreciate you coming on at short notice. Of course, always, Peter. And yeah, I'm, I was uh, I was actually really glad that you brought me on, and uh, I loved hearing the stories. Thank you, man. All right, uh, please do go and check out Peter's podcast as well. It's uh, in the show notes, and also go and check out our last show that we recorded in Miami. I believe it was a few months ago. Go and check that one out. Yep, back in uh, May. Yeah, yeah. Peter, hopefully I'll see you again in person very soon. Um, I prefer that than these remote ones, but I appreciate your time. Always, Peter. Take care.